All right. Well, good morning. Man, it is good to see everyone today. Happy Easter. He is risen. Ah, awesome. It is so good to worship with you on this glorious Easter morning. We welcome you. So a couple of months ago, my wife and I went for a vacation in Cabo San Lucas. We realized this was the first vacation we had taken without children, I think, ever, at least for more than two or three days. Now, I make my wife a little bit nervous when we go to places like Cabo San Lucas, because what I will say to her is all I want to do is three things, basically, sleep, eat, and hang out by the pool. Like, that's like the whole agenda that I have for a place like Cabo San Lucas. Now, my wife gets nervous because she knows me well enough, because after a day of sitting by the pool and eating and sleeping, I have this nervous energy that just begins to erupt. So I was very proud of myself. We were out with friends with dinner for dinner the other night, and we were talking about kind of what we've been doing the last couple of months. And my wife said to our friends, Paul did a great job. She does not speak those words very often to me. So I was super stoked that, like, I actually got it right like I was able to relax and just be there. And so it was a great, wonderful week. So we get in the cab, we take off to the airport, feeling nice and relaxed and wonderful. We go in to check our bags. The ticket agent says, give us all your paperwork. And we had it, I mean, I had it all. I had like our COVID test, because you remember those wonderful things we still get to do. Had the passports, handed her all the paperwork. And she starts going through it, and I'm digging my bag looking for something else. And she said, I need your immigration form. And I said, oh, I I gave that to you. She said, no, I need the form that looks like this. (laughs) Imagine this. Imagine an immigration form, okay? And if you've been to Mexico, you've been to Belize, you've been to other countries, you know, they give you the immigration form when you walk in or when you fly in or whatever you do, you fill it out, you give them that, and then they give you the bottom half of it, right, to hold on to it. And she said, I need the bottom half of your immigration form. Hmm. Okay. So I dig through my backpack, and I'm like, oh, gosh, I really don't remember seeing that form in quite some time. And my wife looks at me, and, and my wife is a saint, I have to tell you this, because she, she is just, she's just so nice and kind, and she's like, don't you remember having those forms? And I'm like, yeah, I remember after the first couple of days having those forms, but I really don't know where they are. And, and, and at this point, you know, the, the, the ticket agent's telling my wife, she's like, well, you can't leave Mexico, right, until you have your immigration forms completed. So I'm like, okay, they've got to be in my suitcase. So I don't know if you've ever been at the airport and you see this person who has unloaded all of their luggage at the, at the ticket counter. Have you, have you ever been that person? Like, I'm the guy. Like, I always look at those people like, what the heck is wrong with them? I have unloaded my entire bag, pants, shirts, board shorts, books, because I'm a pastor, right? I have to travel with at least eight books anytime I go anyplace. I mean, you can just imagine, there's just this pile of stuff right there at the ticket counter for anybody to see. So if you were in Cabo San Lucas in February and you were on Alaska Airline, you might have seen me. I was the guy right there, okay? Now, my wife also knows me well enough that I can't see anything, okay? So I'm the guy who, when we're standing in the refrigerator and she asks me for something in the refrigerator and I'm looking right there and she says, hey, will you just grab the salsa? And I'm like, it's not here. I don't know if any of the rest of you people in this room are like that, but you know the person you're sitting by who is like that, right? So she's like, I'm going to look through your stuff. I'm like, fine. So she looks through my stuff. The ticket agent continues to tell me that we're not going to be able to leave. And so then she's like, well, then you have to go to immigration. And I'm like, where the heck is immigration? And, you know, I kind of all this stuff playing out in my head because I'm the guy who can go to zero to 100 in like half a second, right? So I'm envisioning it, and I love Cabo San Lucas, and I love Mexico, but I'm like, I got stuff I got to do, right? I, I can't be down here. So she's like telling me and how all, all this stuff is and how terrible, and you know, I'm like, oh my gosh. 
and Shannon can't find our immigration form. So I'm like, where's the office? And she points, and it's literally like 100 feet away. So we go in there, explain what happened. And I said, this stuff kind of happens all the time, doesn't it? Like people lose their immigration form. He's like, no, not really. <laughs> He's like, I just don't remember what I did with them. So he takes a post-it note, and he writes like, writes like a number 1250 on it and pushes it in front of me. I'm like, 12, whoa. He's like, pesos. No U.S. cash, no credit card, 1,250 pesos. It's like 30 bucks a piece, right? Which isn't great, but I was, I was envisioning like two or $300. So if you ever lose your immigration form in Mexico, be assured it's not, you're not gonna, it's, it's all okay. Now, and I'm like, okay, and he's like, the ATM machine is down there. Now, I had a victory because I'm, I'm walking out the door. Shannon will test this. And I remember that I have pesos in my pocket because I paid the cab with a credit card instead of pesos. So I whip those things out and I'm like, victory, right? Put them on the counter. We get our immigration form. All is good, right? I'm here to preach and to tell the story. <laughs> so anyway, I still don't remember where I put those forms. I have no idea. But our memory is an interesting thing. And so this morning, that's what we want to talk about, this idea of remembering. Remembering the story, but also remembering what the angels said to the women when they showed up at the tomb. When the gospel of, we are in the Gospel of Luke, 24th chapter, reading the first 12 verses. We read this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, and be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. There's a sense of wonder in this story. The women show up at the tomb wondering why it is empty. The story ends with Peter leaving the empty tomb wondering what has happened. But in between that, the angels speak to the women and say, remember what he told you. Remember that Jesus told you this is how the story was going to go. He must be betrayed. He must die. He must be raised from the dead. And he told that to them several times. But here's what often happens in the midst of the busyness of our lives, in the midst of the craziness that was Holy Week. In the midst of all the uncertainty and all of the unknowns, we sometimes have a hard time remembering. We sometimes have a hard time focusing. And focus matters. Several years ago, I had a friend of mine come down and do a staff retreat with our staff, and we used this process called Strength Finders. Some of you may know Strength Finders. There's the Myers-Briggs, there's the Enneagram, there's all these different ways of kind of assessing where people are at and where their strengths are and what they need to grow in and, and all these sorts of things. And so we sent our entire staff through this process called Strength Finders. Strength Finders has this, this kind of grid and there's 34 strengths that, that you can possibly possess and, and you kind of fall with like the top five. And so we send the entire staff through this Strength Finders process. My buddy Terry calls me up after he's processed all of our information and he's like, Paul, you have an amazing staff. 
They are high functioning. They are creatives. They are. They love to go after a project. They are. You know. They. They. They, they just. They're. They're. They're just this amazing group of people. But there's one thing. And I was like, "There's always one thing, right?" He's like, "There are 34 strengths in Strength Finders, and not one person on your staff has the strength of focus." <laughs> and I was like, "Is that a problem?" He's like, you guys are great at ping-ponging all over the place, starting all sorts of new events, doing all sorts of creative, wild sorts of things, but no one has any focus. And this is true sometimes of our lives. We sometimes lack the focus that we need. We don't remember as we ought to remember I was super excited. It's always nice when God kind of confirms a sermon that you're thinking about a week in advance via your cell phone. I've got your attention now, right? So literally last Saturday morning or afternoon, early afternoon, I was working on on kind of thinking through what I wanted to do on Easter, and I get this notice from Wall Street Journal on my cell phone with an article that's entitled, Why People Keep Forgetting Things. Bingo, right? I'm like, thank you, Lord. Like from the great cloud of witnesses or great cloud of the internet, ethernet, whatever it is, God is confirming why do people keep forgetting things? And the article, it was, it was an interesting article, but I loved what this neuroscientist said. She's like, you need to think about your computer and your computer browser. Everybody has too many tabs open on their computer browser. And you know who you are in this room, Right? Those of you who have 40 open tabs, like your spouse or your friend walks in and you got like 40 tabs all the way across on Safari or out whatever it is that you're using. And some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about, Paul. Computer tabs. Anyway, but her point was this. When you have so many tabs open, your memory begins to fade. The processing speed slows down. The same thing happens to you and to me. We get so overwhelmed. There's so much happening around us. We forget the good news of Jesus. Some of you know there's a a guy named the Apostle Paul who did a lot of church planting and worked with a lot of different people. And one of his favorite protégés who he helped to apprentice was this guy named Timothy. Timothy's a young pastor, pastoring in a town called Ephesus. It's a tough church in a tough time. The Roman Empire is breathing down people's necks, and Timothy grows weary. It's understandable. The Apostle Paul, as he wraps up his second letter to Timothy in the second chapter, verses 8 and 9, says this to Timothy, remember, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead. This is my gospel. Timothy, church, when you grow weary, when you look around and you're like, nothing is making sense, when you cannot remember what you know you ought to be remembering, Remember the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news, the only hope that will sustain us. Do not forget about Jesus. But remembering is hard. And remembering is hard because we have a tendency to drift. We have a tendency, a word, a phrase I've used in different contexts, we have a a, a tendency to wonder and to wander. This is kind of our narrative. We wander and wander and wander, looking for that which will fill us with wonder. And we come up empty. And this is not something new. Like, this is not just because of us living now in the 21st century and all the different stuff that's happening around us. God's people have had a tendency to do this from the very beginning. And so God says to his people, 
I want you to remember, and I'm going to show you how to remember. The nation of Israel, as they're preparing to go into the promised land, and there's this big thing called the Jordan River that's in their way, and God pushes back the waters so the people of Israel can experience freedom and experience life. But God knows they're going to forget what he has done. And so in Joshua chapter four, verses one through seven, we have this story. It says, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, when the nation of Israel had finished crossing, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. So the Jordan was parted and there were stones and boulders there. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, I love this, when your children ask you what do these stones mean, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. God said to the nation of Israel, you know what's going to happen? You're going to forget the story. You're going to forget what has happened. You're going to forget how the waters were pushed back. And so what I want you to do is to choose one man from each of the 12 tribes to go into the Jordan River that is now where the water has been parted and to grab a boulder, to grab a stone and to to carry it on your shoulder. This is not a little rock, okay? This is something that is born on your shoulder and you take those stones and you put them down and there are these 12 stones. The, The word there literally for putting them down means to rest, They're going to rest because God is saying, literally, these these stones remind you of the rest that you can have when you are in me. And then God goes on and says, look, these stones are to remind you, they're to be a memorial, so that when you are with your children and your children's children and you see this pile of rocks, you know that it is more than just a pile of rocks. You get down on your knee and you tell your children and your grandchildren, what God has done, the redemption he has brought, that God has not only passed over, but God has brought promise. And you keep telling the story. Now, let me say something else about stones and boulders. For some of us in this room, We do not carry stones and boulders that remind us of the faithfulness of God. Instead, we create a pile of stones of every failure that we have done or not done, of every broken promise, of all the things that have not gone as they ought to go, of all of the shame. And rather than looking at God's faithfulness and these stones that speak to the goodness and wonder and glory of God, we have created a pile of stones of failure and uncertainty. And we look at those. And if we're doing that, and if you're doing that, you know where that leads. Sadness, Sorrow, grief, shame. You need to get rid of those stones. You need to quit focusing on those. And instead, focus on what God has done for you in and through Jesus Christ. You see, we still wonder and we still wander. But I am convinced that deep within each and every one of us, 
there is a whisper. Perhaps a very faint whisper that speaks of the goodness and glory of God. There is an echo, as N.T. Wright would talk about, there's this echo of a voice that somehow is still stirring and still moving and still saying, remember God's goodness. Remember what God has done. Remember that Jesus is for you. So one last story before we conclude this morning. This is from the cross. Still in Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Looking at the 23rd chapter, verses 38 through 43. Jesus is hanging there with one man on each side of him. We read this. There was written, there was a written notice above Jesus which read, This is the King of the Jews. When the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. One criminal looks at Jesus and says, save yourself and save us, get us off this terrible cross. The second criminal, something has happened in his life, we don't know what happened, but his first words are, don't you fear, don't you revere the goodness of God. Don't you see that this man is innocent? And then the criminal says, Jesus, when you get to your kingdom, although we know Jesus has already brought his kingdom, but when you get there, would you remember me? Because the criminal, if you, if you, if you think through this story, the criminal has been hanging there with Jesus When Jesus looks out on the crowd, the people that have deceived him, the people that have betrayed him, and what does he say? He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they've done. And I can just hear the criminal saying, Jesus, can you forgive me? Forgive me for what I have done or not done. Jesus, would you remember me? And Jesus says, yes, I do and I will. I will remember you. And you see, this is the beauty of Easter. That as we wander, and as we wander, and as we make our way, Jesus says, I forgive you. I remember you. I love you. I shared this at our Thursday evening worship service, and I think it's an important aspect of the story of betrayal. We looked at this text where Simon Peter had just denied three, Jesus three times, which we know that story, but in the Gospel of Luke, it tells us that as Simon Peter betrayed him the third time and the rooster crowed, Jesus walked by and looked at Peter. And I don't know what that look was like. But I suspect it was a look of grace and forgiveness. But the point that I made right after that was this. The yes of Jesus is always stronger than Simon Peter's no. The yes of Jesus is always stronger and more powerful than any of the no's that we have possibly offered for why we don't wanna trust God, for why we don't wanna have faith, for why we have walked away, for why we have whatever it is. It is the yes of Jesus that ultimately matters and that he looks at each and every one of us and says, I love you, I love you, I love you. I lay down my life 
not only that you might have everlasting life, not only that you might be with me, not only that you might see me in the future, but that you might have the abundant life right here, right now. And if you get nothing else from our message this morning, and if you're carrying those boulders of shame and sadness and sorrow, I pray that as you walk out these doors, you'll just turn your back on them. And you will see the one who can be the bedrock of your life. And that you will know the everlasting love of Jesus. Do not let the things of this world wear you down and wear you out. Remember what Christ has done. Pray with me, please. Jesus, we are prone to wonder and we are prone to wander. And as we do that, we lose focus. There's lots of things coming at us in this world. And sometimes it is hard to remember that we are simply loved for who we are, that God, when you see us, you see us through the lens of Jesus. And Lord, some of us here this morning need to hear that. We need to know of your faithfulness, God. We need to quit trusting in the things of this world and Lord, start looking to you. Lord, if that is us, may we step forward in faith this day as we walk out these doors. May we remember, God, that you remember us in and through Jesus. Lord, great is your faithfulness, and we are grateful. Thank you for remembering us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.